Hey guys, a while ago I asked a question in my story if there were any things you guys wanted to ask me and I would make a YouTube video to answer your Instagram questions, which I did. Um, as I said before, I did a couple of these videos with Instagram questions, but uh, a lot of them are from new people who may have not seen the older videos that we've done uh, on the same subject. So I did it like two or three times before. And obviously everybody asks the same questions over and over again, which is normal because uh, I understand not everybody watches the YouTube channel or goes through these videos. Um, but anyways, I can keep answering the same questions and they're obviously the same like, um, what's the best chassis or what's better an E30 or an E46 or E46 versus E90 or how does Ackerman work? And all those questions are already answered. Uh, and a lot of those things are uh, also in uh, different videos. So. Just check it out, a lot of the tangent uh, videos, they um, talk about that. So anyways, uh, the questions that we have this time are the following. One of them is, why do a lot of DMAC drivers have power steering issues? Um, I can tell you from experience that that also applies to Formula Drift. So that's one question, uh, power steering issues in pro drifting, we should call that. Uh, another question was, if I would rather have an E36, a complete standard E36 with full Weissfab, or a turbo M50 E36 with a cheap angle kit. So that's another question. Uh, full wise up E36, stock E36, E36 versus um, turbo E36 with a cheap angle kit. Um, there's another question on uh, how would I get into Drift Masters or a, a European Drifting Series uh, as an amateur. So I'll touch upon that subject as well. Uh, a really good question I found was what um, is stuff that you expected on Formula Drift and what was unexpected on Formula Drift. So which things were as I expected them to be and which things were totally different than I expected. It's a really good question. And the last question is um, if my company Einzel, if we allow visitors to, uh, to come over to the shop. So um, yeah, so let's start with the power steering issue stuff. Uh, we had uh, the uh, Drift Masters finals in uh, Poland in the stadium event uh, just a week ago and uh, there were a lot of guys with power steering issues and obviously those are really good teams, they're very experienced builders, they're very experienced drifters so they're not crazy, they know what they're doing. Um, you see a lot of guys running electro hydraulic power steering, so it's not electric power steering, it's still hydraulic but it uses an electric pump to get the pressure to the rack and um, there have been a lot of problems with the regular power steering. That's also why a lot of guys go to uh, electro-hydraulic power steering. Obviously, the motors make a lot more RPM now, um, so that's not always great. You need to underdrive a standard power steering pump or mechanical power steering pump anyways, uh, which is what we're doing with the FD Corvette. So it's definitely not as easy. Um, I am at one of these things, like we are also working in that field, obviously, so I don't want to disclose everything. So there's a couple things that we do, uh, a couple tricks that we uh, use um, to mitigate those problems. As you guys may know from the build video, my V8 um, E46 has electric power, electro hydraulic power steering, which works great. That's a pump that we uh, almost completely rebuilt and changed. A lot of um, the components in that uh, pump are upgraded. However, that was really expensive. That was more than 2000 euros. So it doesn't really make much sense for us to sell that to people. And um, it's one of those things that I like to help people, but we also don't share a hundred percent of the information about the pro cars. Obviously, if people are clients and they buy our stuff, it's a little bit different, but we're not gonna give people uh, a step-by-step -step guide to solve those problems. Um, so yeah, so that's like one thing I can tell you though a couple of things uh, one of them is that the line size is extremely important um, And that has to do with the fact that uh, the heat which is a big problem in power steering systems The heat does not always come from the pump. So people think oh the pump is uh, Spinning around that's where all the heat comes from. That's not true The heat comes from the rack because these days cars have a lot of grip especially in DMAC NFD and the Pro Series uh, the cars are very powerful and they go from lock really fast, uh, 70 degrees to the left, 70 degrees to the right, just like that. 
Um, so that's obviously never uh, something that those racks were designed to handle. So um, obviously uh, they have the same travel as standard. So it's not like the racks travel further. Um, that would happen if you use these um, little rings or spacers that people put between the tie rods and the rack, which we never do because it just moves the rack further, which is usually going to cause it to leak. So we don't like doing that. So the racks are not moving further uh, than they would be on the standard S chassis or on a standard Corvette, but it goes way, way faster because the geometry of the knuckle is obviously changed and they go from 70 degrees to one side to 70 degrees or 60 degrees or whatever you set it to. Um, also, because the cars have scrub, which basically means that the center line of the wheel is moved further away from the knuckle, which is almost like um, if you put an extension on a wrench, it means that you're pulling harder on a bolt. If you have, if my uh, hand is a bolt and this is a, a wrench and you extend it, you're putting more force on the bolt. Uh, and that's what you're doing when you're moving the, the wheel out of the knuckle. You're also putting more force on the knuckle and more force on the rack. So it's also one of those things that people need to consider. And the line size is extremely important because that violent movement in the rack, that's going to cause uh, the heat in the system. And if there's a small problem with the, the size of the lines, uh, that can cause big problems. Um, however, you should also keep in mind, like you, you need to double and triple check everything. So people are like, I have a dash six feed line or I have a dash eight return line, but not every dash eight is the same. The dash part, um, refers to the outside so which tool you put on the outside and dash or an uh, an is army navy as i talked about before it's because the american military was so sick of all the different systems that they said we'll, we'll make an army navy system which is an and it's an dash six or an dash 10 or an dash 20 and people just started calling it dash 20 or dash 10 or dash six so that's why i mean by that is the uh, red and blue uh, aluminum um, fittings and one thing that you need to consider is that you can have an AN6 um, fitting, which uses the AN6 wrench, but does not have the same inner diameter as a different AN6. So that's a, that's a big thing over there. So if you're just copying what somebody else is doing, it doesn't always work. Uh, with the FD car, we um, had a lot of problems with the power steering. We actually copied the setup of a different Corvette um, I was a little skeptical about it uh, because obviously I work a lot with YSFAP and YSFAP has the fastest transitions, the most angle and the easiest uh, movements from left to right. So there's angle kits that I drive with. Yeah, they'll do 65 degrees, but you can't really drive in the 65 degrees. 65 degrees is basically you'll drive the car on 50 degrees and when it spins out, you can briefly go to 65, but you can't really use it like the Corvette that Max Kimlin had uh, that I drove in New York in January uh, 2021. Uh, or 2022 definitely had that problem uh, where it would have angle, but you couldn't really use that angle because the angle kit geometry was just incorrect. Um, so what, what happens is um, with YSFAP, you use that full sweep. So if a YSFAP kit does 65 degrees, you can drift it on 65 degrees. It will actually go down the road at 65 degrees and back. So obviously if you do fast transition is what people want to see these days and judges want to see snap transitions they want to see snap entries uh, what you do a really quick flick like for instance some of you guys have driven at apple valley obviously uh, that's definitely uh tough on the on the rack like the first uh, entry because you're driving down the straight you have the little house on your right at least that's what um a lot of people look at and i don't even know what i look at is just flick the wheel and then you just turn it left right and then immediately comes back. So that's really tough on the rack because the whole weight of the car is coming around because you're using the momentum to push the car to angle. Uh, and that's really hard on the rack because the rack is just getting fast forwarded because of the geometry of the angle kit, uh, which is something that would never happen. Like if you see these guys doing transitions in D-Make, they let go of the steering wheel because your hands cannot follow the steering wheel. So that's not how you drive a road car. In a road car, you can never do that so fast. It's just impossible. But in drifting, if you have the correct geometry and you let the car move from left to right, what's going to happen uh, is that you let go of the steering wheel and the steering wheel goes so fast that you couldn't catch it with your hand. And that obviously also means that the wreck is moving really fast. Um, and that uh, puts a lot of heat and a lot of pressure uh, in the rack, especially in the return. So that's super important. So that's a couple of things to keep in mind. Line size, extremely important. And also test things. So 
Uh, a power steering pump does not make pressure. It doesn't make any pressure. It flows. So it flows a certain amount of fuel in a certain amount of time. If you have a car, it doesn't matter what it is, BMW, uh, FD, RX7, Honda Civic, whatever, you can check how much your original power steering pump is flowing. It's very, very simple. It's the amount of fluid it moves in a certain time. You want to have that same or better amount of fluid that it moves in a certain amount of time on an electro-hydraulic power steering setup. You can test that as well. So that's about as much information as I give about the fact. Our clients, uh, I'll tell them a little bit more and I'll give them a little more precise information. Uh, but like for just in general, generally speaking, that's a couple things that you really want to keep in mind. So the next question, would I rather have a standard E36 with a Wisefab uh, kit or a M50 Turbo E36 with a cheap angle kit? And with cheap, I believe people may mean like the $100, the little blocks that you put on the knuckle or something. Um, although we also have a cheap kit now, of course, the Wise Shop Do It Yourself kit, which is on Brian's car, which is on my white E36 car and a couple other cars. I think Audi is going to put it on a car as well. Um, and that's uh, 500 euros or $600. Uh, and it's completely compatible with the Pro Kit if you want to upgrade to the Pro Kit later. So you can check it out. I'll put the link in the description. The Wise Do It Yourself Kit, very, very cheap kit uh, with uh, the Wise Fab uh, geometry and the Wise Fab quality that you know. So, but let's just say, like, all right, let's just run a completely standard uh, E36 with Wise Fab against an M50 Turbo E36 with a cheap angle kit or cut knuckles or whatever you want to call it. Um, it obviously kind of depends on what you want to do with it. So, my M3 is a completely stock M3 with Wise Fab and fuel suspension. So, I obviously love that car. I love it way more than I expected. Um, it does everything great. It's uh, the most reliable car ever to do Drift Week. And um, yeah, it's one of my favorite cars, turned into one of my favorite cars in just two years. So this definitely doesn't mean that uh, it needs to have like four or 500 horsepower to have fun with it. Uh, it depends on the tracks. If you're on a smaller track, you can definitely use a stock E36 with Wisefab. It's also not just about what the car can do. It's not like, oh, you don't want to do these huge FD entries and big angle uh, with a... Um, with a missile, it's not just about that, it's also the reliability, especially in a missile or a seat time car or a simple car or a stock motor car or a pro -am car or whatever you want to call it. You want to have seat time, so you want it to be super reliable. And that's also why I would run WiseFed because if you buy an E36 325, um, even the nicest one with 40,000 miles, it's going to have 1992 control arms, it's going to have 1992 tie rods, it's going to have 1992 top mounts and the chassis mounts or lollipops it's all going to be old so you need to replace it anyways if you go to a bmw dealer and you buy the control arms the tie rods the inner tie rods the top mounts and the lollipops that costs more than wise fab and then people say yeah but i can get them cheap for like 300 bucks and then you get like china stuff so that's not comparable that's not the same thing and you're also not going to have a lot of reliability so if you want to have a simple c time car um that's it's going to suck more if it breaks all the time because you have a low power motor so you can do a lot of laps without burning through the tires in europe we drive in the wet a lot so um, you can do a whole day with one set of rear tires so you have this all you can eat uh drifting days uh, so you don't want to be breaking control arms and uh, ball joints and all kinds of things and top mounts and whatever the whole time so especially for a simple car i would want to have wise fab whether it's the pro kit or the do-it-yourself kit, just because of that reliability, because that's why you want a simple car, you know, you don't want to work on it the whole time. And if you run the stock stuff, you're definitely going to be working on it the whole time, unless you put high quality new stuff on it, but that's going to, you know, eat into your budget and you're still not going to have any angle and running a car without any angle, especially if you want to drive with your buddies and stuff that gets old uh, pretty quick. So it's obviously fun. My white E36 uh, sedan, the Kalashnikov had very little angle, um, cut knuckles and um, standard control arms, standard E36 control arms, which is just a little more angle, maybe eight degrees more than a stock. And it was fine, but I could never obviously run with my buddies who had like a big angle kit because they could just slow the car down a lot more. And that's also one of those things. Um, it just gives you extra ammo to slow the car down. It's not just the angle uh, that you drive in. It's also like, oh, all right, uh, I'm going to make this clip. I'll just throw a little more angle at it. You can almost slow the car down to a zero and still have total control and, and make that turn. 
um, reverse entries and stuff, obviously for practicing that. It's nice if you have a little bit of angle. Everybody's always gonna shout, no, if you're a great driver, you can do a backwards entry with a standard car, just give it to me. Yes, Chelsea, the Nova, Luke Fink, James Dean, those guys can do reverse entries and stuff with a standard car. And I'm sure there's a lot of pro-am drivers. If you give them a hundred laps, they can pull it off as well a couple times. But that's just not realistic. That's just not for normal people. If you want to do 10 laps at Apple Valley Speedway and you want to do six backwards entries that are successful, you definitely want an angle kit on the car. And everybody can comment like, no, I don't need it. Great. But that's just not, that's just not realistic. All right. So uh, yeah, so I would rather have a stock E36 uh, versus a turbo E36 with a cheap kit because especially if you put a little bit more power on the car, you're putting more stress on it. And then I don't want to rely on something cheap or some Chinese made thing. It's just not my, my style, um, especially not if you're there for the seat time. If you don't really care or you do it for the gram or for YouTube for breaking stuff and oh, I told up my car. Sure, great, you know, run unreliable stuff that you can't get any spares for or whatever, of course, do it. But it's just not my thing. So if I had to choose between a completely stocky 36 or any 36 turbo, um, and uh, the stock one would have y swept and turbo would not have a uh, y swept then I would definitely take the, the standard car with y swept um, so yeah that's that question answered thank you for asking so another question is how do you get into drift masters um, or on the European series as an amateur I understand that it's all very difficult um, obviously there's a lot of money involved and People should really realize that there's only a very small percentage of guys that don't have money that make it uh, to those levels. And um, yeah, there's a couple guys that do it on a low budget, but then if you price out their car, the car is always going to be 30 or 40 grand at least. And they're going to do a lot of work themselves. So they do all the welding themselves or their brother builds the motor or they work at a garage and they can use the alignment stuff or they work at a paint shop and they can do the paint themselves or all that kind of stuff. And like, that's kind of like the difficult thing. So there's a lot of guys that are weekend warriors that do it on a budget, but their, their value, their actual value is way higher. So I always give Brendan Wicknick as an example. I always say you can run a really cheap car if you're Brendan Wicknick, because he has a skill set and he has experience and a shop and a network uh, to make a, uh, a budget car a budget oriented program work but that's not for everybody if you're not him uh it's, it's not going to be easy for you to do that i would almost say it's impossible for you to do that um so that's one of those things you're going to need a lot of money it's simple as that because you need to go through a lot of tires um there's guys that have this god-given talent like for instance adam zalewski a friend of mine a really good young driver from poland um they are on a pretty tight budget. Uh, he really deserves some more sponsors, um, but right now it's, it's all a little bit tight. So he doesn't do a lot of practice just because he doesn't have the tires to do a lot of practice. And that's one of those things that, because if you have a really, really uh, huge talent like him, then that can work. You know, he goes to a track that he's been before. He does one or two laps to feel it out. And he's like, all right, that works. The car works here gear ratio works and whatever, and they'll just send it uh, into the qualifying and into the battles. And you'll see guys like that grow in the battles a lot, getting better and better. However, if you are um, not somebody like Adam Zalewski or Chelsea or whatever with a God-given talent, you need to have a lot of seat time and seat time in a pro car is something completely different than seat time in a practice car. Some stuff uh, transfers over. Uh, I don't think I've ever done as much driving um, as I did on the drift weeks and I did four of them in America and then I hopped into my pro car in August for two events in Germany and of course there's some stuff that transfers over but the pro car is also a lot different than your than your simple seat time car because uh, you need to mitigate the forward motion as well so the car is way faster if you have a 600 wheel horsepower E46 against uh, 280 horsepower E46 you can have the exact same steering and the exact same suspension or whatever, but that pro car is going to be a lot lighter. It's going to have twice the power. So you also need to mitigate how it moves forward. You need to drive it way more aggressively because it has way more grip. Uh, like I said, it's lighter. So you, the mass uh, doesn't flow as it does on a heavier drift wheel car. So no matter what, no matter how many track days you do with a simple seat time car, even if it has the exact same suspension, 
both my pro car and my drift week car have exact same wise fab feel suspension it's all the same uh different spring rates of course because it's different weights but like it's the same idea however there's only so much you can learn from your seat time car you really need to get laps in with your pro car to feel it out um just to make sure that 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 you also get that forward motion so how fast that car accelerates to how you end up at that perfect entry speed because most of the missiles and most of the practice cars you're almost full throttle the whole time so that's that's easy because you don't have to think about how much throttle you're applying because you're always on full throttle uh one of my friends chris drives the corvette co6 and he drove that on drift week and there were people commenting saying like oh he's dragging the handbrake and this and that because that car is 600 horsepower you know and that's like it you see a dot in a distance and the car is there. I drove that car at Poconos um, and it's a very, very fast car. So people that have cars that are not fast basically means that their right foot is always planted and they're always full throttle. And you can say like, oh, it's so great to do it with a low powered car. But I, I said it before in these videos, there's this meme where it says, if you can't drift with a hundred horsepower, a thousand horsepower is not gonna help you. That's true, but if you can drift with a hundred horsepower, it does not mean you can drift with a thousand horsepower. People think that an FD car or a DMAC car, that's so easy to drive. It's got 800 horsepower. You just flex your foot and lights up the rears and you make that clip. Those cars are hard to drive. Like watch my um, video with Odie. It's gonna be in the description. Odie says it's a very, very difficult car to drive. And Odie, the president of fuel suspension, he knows how to set up cars. He's been doing this for a while. He says those FD cars are very difficult to drive because they are very wound up. I've said it before. Um, they have way more power, but they also have way more grip, which doesn't make them very easy to drive. It's like a slingshot between corners. Um, so that's the whole problem with if you're an amateur and you want to get into pro drifting, you need to drive a lot with your pro car as well. And that's just gonna cost a lot of money one way or the other. And if you're not uh, a household name, if you're not James or, or Connor, uh, you're not gonna get tires for free. And you need to go through, let's say 200 or 300 tires a year just to get some practice in. I think Chelsea always says to be a pro, you need to drive 50 days a year or maybe 60. I don't know what he says. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Chelsea, but I, th I think it's at least 50. And that seems like, oh, 50, that's doable. But that's like 50, that's like every week. It means you drive one day a week for the whole year. Um, and if you look at our Corvette, the FD Corvette, um, it can usually do two laps with a set of tires. So if you're doing, uh, if you're doing a bunch of laps in a day, um, you know, if you do, if you do 40 laps, uh, on a day that means that you go through 20 sets of tires in one day that's 20 sets of tires in one day for just 40 laps so if you do the math if you do uh, 20 sets a day and you do 50 days a year you know it's pretty easy it's a thousand sets that's two thousand tires a year so i mean that's that's just how it works and of course you don't have to do 50 days in your pro car but then it's like 700 sets a year so you just need you either need that tire sponsor or you need that money and that's all provided that you have a pro card it always works and the mapping always works and it doesn't have any failing sensors or whatever so it's just very very difficult um the seat time part that's the difficult thing i would say come to america and do drift week because you can do so much driving on the dry which in europe is just not possible a lot of people comment online, oh, Drift Masters so much better than FD. I love Drift Masters. I think it's fantastic. But I am a European. I drift in America. Um, drift Masters is a large part of European drifting. FD is a tiny part of American drifting. There's so much more grassroots and stuff going on in America. It outnumbers the European uh, grassroots stuff with a thousand to one, at least. So people think, oh, DMAC, it means that all these guys are just driving around in Ireland the whole time and in Finland. It's just not true. They have comp competitions, but there's not a lot of grassroots stuff. If you just want to drive around a little bit, um, it's very, very difficult in Europe. In my country and in Germany, uh, there's not so many practice days. In America, you can, in California, you can practice every day of the week, uh, the whole year. You can go to Apple Valley, you can go to Willow Springs, you can go to Adams. 
it's all within an hour an hour and a half from each other it just doesn't exist in europe uh dmac is fantastic but the grassroots stuff and the practicing stuff in europe it's not so easy it kind of sucks so uh, I would say if you're an amateur and you're super um, interested in getting to DMAC, do Drift Week or get some kind of four or five, six, ten thousand dollar seat time car in America and come to America for a couple of weeks, come to California or to another state where there's a lot of driving where you can just drive. Uh, the fuel is way cheaper. Um, you can drive for 50 or 100 bucks a day where in Europe you're paying 200 or 300 or 400 bucks a day. So um, if you want to do those 50 days, on track, uh, I think it's gonna cost you half to do them in America. So that's almost what I would recommend to uh, uh, drivers in Europe. Thanks for that question. Don't forget to take a look at our website as well, einzel.nl. We ship worldwide, of course, Wisefab, Field Suspension, our own brand, Einzel, gearboxes, quick change differentials, axles, all kinds of things. A lot of fabrication components, of course, air jacks, subframes for quick change, you name it. Drop us an email and we'll hook you up. So on to the next question. Uh, what did uh, I think about FD? What went as expected and what was unexpected? Um, that's a really good question. I like that. I enjoyed uh, being involved in FD a lot. Um, as you guys know, I get along with Americans really well. Uh, I love competition and um, I love um, being with uh, with the team that I'm with right now. They're all really good people. Uh, what I expected was also that it was gonna be tough. Um, there's a lot of really good drivers also in pro spec. Obviously Robert Thorne winning in his uh, rookie year Dmitry Brutsky is really good, but also guys like Ben Hobson, my friend Andy Haitley, having the best season of his uh, life, I think, or best his best FD season ever this year. Um, There's so many great guys. Like, I couldn't name a prospect driver that's really bad. Obviously, Derek Madison doing really well. My buddy Casey Cole, uh, M-Spec Performance, and all those guys doing really, really well. So... I, I expected it to be tough um, and I expected it to be tougher for us because we'd never been there. We'd never been to Orlando or New Jersey or St. Louis um, or Utah. Uh, Utah, nobody had been before except for Rome and JTP, Odie and a couple guys that did some testing there, but we had never been there, obviously. And also our car is also uncharted territory. It's a Corvette with the transmission in the front. That's been done before. Taylor Hall had it obviously in the car, but we are the ones running it with the fuel suspension and the way we run it with the front radiator and all that stuff. So it was a little bit of a question mark. So I expected it to be difficult to dial the car in and I expected it to be difficult to win battles against those guys. Um, dialing in the car wasn't that difficult. The car really responded well to our changes. Uh, we had a lot of problems with uh, the supercharger. Sadly, I have to say, if you go back to the videos we did uh, earlier before the season started, I also mentioned it. I, I expect problems with the supercharger. I think I said, I don't know anybody in drifting who didn't have huge problems with the belts. That sadly happened. Uh, we had a lot of belt problems with it. We made a lot of changes. Uh, Nate, with the fabrication, Eric Welch, the crew chief, um, everybody, like even uh, um, uh, Nick, who is obviously the electronics guy and myself. Uh, we all spent a lot of time on trying to mitigate that. And that was, sadly, that was as expected because we didn't really want to run the supercharger. It was the motor that we had from Richard's car, from Richard's road racing car. The motor that we ordered in Texas was delayed. Um, so we were kind of like forced and we were always going to do FD. Like it was never a question mark. We were going to make that mark. And even if we were not going to make it, we were still going to make it. And... We didn't really make it uh, because uh, making it would mean that you're testing three days before you leave and everybody gets a good night's sleep and we didn't like we worked around the clock on that car for more than 50 days i was going to bed at 4 a.m and eric was coming out of <laughs> out of his door at 4 a.m to start working on the car and it was a crazy period where i didn't even know what day it was or whatever and we, it's so many small problems so many small fires that we had to put out parts delays all kinds of parts that didn't fit and all kinds of stuff so it was very very tough we had to dyno the car on the way to orlando we had a certain time frame to make it to orlando 
and that time frame forced us to dyno the car on the way so we dynoed it in las vegas with kyle which we were really grateful for we tested it um on uh dan brockett's uh, track the track that he uh he's involved with uh in new mexico and sandia which we we're also really happy about so but that's not how you want to do it like you want to have the car ready to go you want to test it at apple valley or at willow or some track that you know and then you know after all the little problems and little things with a new car are done you take it to uh, orlando but we had only maybe two and a half days to make it to orlando and do the dyno and do the testing on the track so that was very very tough um so it's just a matter of will over scale at one point you're just like and richard is a guy that also doesn't give up like there was never any question that we were not going to make it we were always going to make it and that's like really testament to how great the crew was especially for a new crew that had never worked together it's a completely new team and that's what some people forget like everything was new for us like the tracks were new but also the team was new um, and there's guys that have been in the same team for years before they go to fd um well, we were a brand new team with a brand new car with a brand new setup uh richard only driving for two and a half years and then going to the most prestigious competition in america maybe the world uh and tracks that we've never been so i i expected it to be tough um but i enjoyed every second of it like i felt so at home from the american the other crew guys the other drivers the fans everybody that came up to me also you guys the youtube followers that came up at fd that like hey you don't know me but i follow your channel i'm like every time i'm so surprised that that even happens like it's crazy for me that i come from the other side of the world and it's guys watching these videos and uh in orlando even the first day uh, i was sitting in a grandstand watching the car go down the track and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said hey come sit with us uh and like uh, i'm almost uh, every time that happens i'm like did i did i meet this person i want to be rude i want to ask them who they are but they're like oh you don't know me but i follow your channel and i'm like this is so amazing. I love that. So it was expected that it was going to be tough. And I expected the supercharger problems. Um, and yeah, you know, so we had our fair share of issues. We qualified every time. Uh, we got the car dialed in every time. I'm really happy with the setups that we got in the car. Uh, fuel suspension is, is really is an eye opener. If you saw how that car worked in Orlando coming off the bank, um i had a really weird setting in the car because i was like hey the car is going to come off the bank so the rebound the compression all that stuff needs to be in a weird setting i'm not 100 percent sure how that's going to work we also have the exhaust under the subframe in the back of course corvette's very difficult with the rear muffler so we had that boom tube which is still like an inch and a half or two inches thick it's very wide it's like a letter box but it goes under the subframe so it's like man we're gonna smash that damn thing up so bad coming off the bank in orlando but i was like i just need to run this and that i can't get away with any other shock setting than this and i was like i hope the car is going to make it and i hope the car is going to handle it. it's going to drive well and i was on the radio with richard after a second lap and i was like man how does it feel coming off the bank and he's like dude it's like a cadillac it feels so smooth and then we later watched the high speed camera footage and the car came off the bank and it almost immediately stopped bouncing and richard could immediately go on throttle and there's some footage on my instagram and that car is so fast like we were really really booking uh, orlando the car looked so good and and pulling out um into that first left hander in the infield the car was really nobody's fool um i did all the timing of course we were on the same elapsed time as the pro guy so really happy with that then we had the rain of course or like a thunderstorm or whatever so it was like kind of like our problem we were like the second battle to go out in the rain so it wasn't really that easy and Nate Chen beat us fair and square although Nate also spun uh, I think Richard spun his lead in his chase or over over rotate or something and Nate Chen only spun in his lead or something like that so it was just a messy battle it went to Nate and that was like our first event so I kind of expected it to be difficult I was also super grateful for how well the team already worked from the beginning and of course there's always hiccups because you're in a different environment all our guys are laid back easy going guys um the spirit that we have in the team is also very laid back and very relaxed there's no bouncing uh, around or like slamming your fist on the table and 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 being very um uh like flexing your authority or whatever that doesn't happen like it's all very friendly 
a very good uh, environment. Um, and I think that that's like one of those things. If you go to FD, there's a lot of rules and they FD market stuff so well as uh, premier motorsports that they want everything to go perfect and they don't want any uh, unprofessional stuff happening. And, and you can't be laid back in FD. You need to be on your toes and you need to keep the rules. And, and it's just not the rules for building the car. That's one thing, but all the, the codes of conduct and everything, uh, you need to be really, really clear. You need to be on your toes, which I think is a really good thing because you're representing a sport. You're representing the pinnacle of that sport. And it just needs to be marketable. It needs to be presentable. And that's just how it works. Um, what I didn't expect, uh, that's the second thing, uh, the second part of this question. What I didn't really expect is how little you see the other crews and the other drivers. And some of them are friends of mine and I don't even see them. So we travel from California to New Jersey and I hardly see my friends who are crewing for a different team or who are driving uh, who are drivers at a different team. I, I don't hardly see them or spend time with them because I kind of expected like, oh man, this guy did drift week with and we're going to hang out and uh, we're going to get some burgers. And every the teams are obviously all minding their own business and it's just a lot of work. Like you need to get all your stuff together. There's all the big trailers and everything needs to be managed and the tires. And in Europe, guys just show up with one car on a the trailer. They've got one mechanic uh, and it's just a little less professional um, in FD, there's this level of professionalism with the teams. Obviously, it's also very hot. And that's another thing. Like, everywhere we went, it, it was weird weather. Like, we had a crazy thunderstorm in Orlando. Uh, obviously, it was very hot uh, in the summer months in, in uh, Jersey. In St. Louis was extremely humid and hot. So, guys will be in the trailer, in the air-conditioned trailer all the time. They're not walking around the pit. So the videos need to be edited and I need to get all the uh, footage from the uh, video guys and the uh, footage from our own guys and the footage from um, any, any other teams that may have uh, made some video from our car and all that stuff. So that's also a little time consuming. So it's not like you have a lot of time left over uh, in the evenings on FD events. So it's definitely one of those things. Uh, there's a lot less time uh, to hang around with your buddies than you would think. And um, the last question that we're going to be talking about, somebody asked, like, is it possible to visit your shop? Um, like I said, I have a shop in the Netherlands. Uh, a lot of you guys may know that. Uh, some of the newer viewers may not know that. Um, and no, it's not open for the public. You can't just show up um, and uh, look around. The reason why we don't have that is because we build pro race cars, pro drift cars, and I want to have my concentration uh, whilst doing there. Everybody that's working on the cars uh, just wants to keep working. They don't want to be disturbed or anything. And I'm sure you can understand if I'm putting together a motor uh, and somebody's constantly walking in or having questions, it breaks your concentration. If you forget one little washer or forget one little uh, torque spec on a bolt, uh, that can have big consequences. And also, it's also a process that happens a lot in your head when you're building a car. It's not just putting stuff together when the car is finished and people looking at it uh, it's always funny to me they're saying oh you just cut it over there oh you just did that and you just drilled it out you just put the, oh you used that seven series thing over there right yeah it's easy it's all easy when it's done when the car is finished when it's standing there when it's ready to go then everything is easy in retrospect but once you just have a stripped shell sitting there in your shop and you have a bunch of parts it needs a lot of thinking at least for me, a lot of thought goes into where everything goes. Uh, we're doing the S14 right now, and I can easily spend half an hour thinking about how am I going to route like a brake line or uh, the throttle cable or something like that. How are we going to get the best weight distribution on the car? How is the car going to be the easiest to work on? It's just not as simple. Even if you've done 100 cars, it doesn't matter. Every car is a little bit different. One's going to be front radiator V8. The other is going to be um, maybe a, a BMW M50 Turbo with a rear radiator and everything is just a little bit different. So it just takes a lot of, of uh, work in your head as well. And I just want to be able to, you know, kind of like bond with a car as weird as it may sound and like just don't have anything breaking my concentration. There's also no phones in the shop. Um, there's just uh, the playlist that we run on uh, Spotify uh, that I often share, like like little pieces of it or a little screenshot of it on Instagram. And that's just how it works. I don't want to have anybody walking in and out, not even people, delivery people or whatever. It's all just completely shut off from uh, from the outside world uh, where we want to be left alone and build our cars and do our stuff. And obviously 
before we had a lot of people who would come in and pick up parts and all that stuff but now that everything's gone so international we're just shipping everything people are not coming out of sweden or romania or florida to pick up a part so that's all just shipped and the guys do a great job doing that and uh, we also moved away from the administrative uh, and billing part of it it does not happen at the shop anymore it's on a different location so um, those things have been separated a couple of years ago so all i want to do is is just work on the cars and focus on that um, we're contemplating on doing some open house days so people can come and check it out but to be perfectly honest it's my life is kind of busy right now obviously i'm, I'm kind of like burning the candle on two sides um with the fd stuff and 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 with the stuff in the netherlands so um i'm totally enjoying it i get a lot of energy from it but it's just like weeks fall off the calendar just like that so that's just how it goes guys i'm sorry uh, but you can obviously watch all the youtube videos obviously we don't show everything on the youtube videos but uh, you can get kind of a good idea how the shop works um and if there's any open house in the future or visitor days we're obviously gonna tell you on the social media channels Thank you guys so much for all the questions. If there's any other questions, you can also post them in the comments. I reply to every single comment. Sometimes it takes a while, but every single comment that you guys make, I reply to it. Really appreciate all the feedback and appreciate you watching this video. I think it's pretty long. It's like half an hour video probably. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to comment, subscribe, obviously. Um, it's a really small channel. It doesn't, it doesn't bring any uh, monetization or whatever that makes any sense, but uh, still, um, yeah, I, I like doing it for myself. I like doing it for you guys. So um, thank you so much for supporting and uh, have a great day.